it's true and I'm smarter than us. No, he's not. All right, everybody. All right. Um, Don, you may want to check. Um, you may want to check your settings because I know the audio is working because I'm getting people responding to me. So hopefully the audio is up and working fine. All right, everybody. It is 10 o'clock, and that means it's time for class to begin. Now, remember, I see your messages coming in. I see all your comments. I just won't be able to stop and acknowledge, but please know that I see and know that you guys are there. Let me tell you a couple of things. We've got a lot of stuff to cover, so I'm going to go through this pretty quick because there's so much stuff going on. First of all, so many of you asked about my book, which is not out yet, but uh, let me explain what happened. Originally, we were only taking pre-orders through Amazon. But then we started taking pre-orders through our website, the dinosaurgeorge.com website. Well, contractually, we couldn't take any more advanced orders through my website because we had already reached the quota that we were allowed. So we are no longer taking pre-orders on our Dinosaur George website. You can pre-order them through Amazon. That's still in effect. Now, these books are supposed to come in in June, and when we get the books, they will go live on my website, and I'll be able to offer them through there. But for right now, if you want to order an advanced copy right now, then you do that through Amazon. If not, hang on, and, and you'll be able to order it through my website. All right, that's that. Next, the um, we're still doing private lessons. I just wanted to tell you one more time. Dates are starting to run out for this special rate price. The normal price to have me do a private lesson is $125 per lesson. But we're running a special till the end of May that if you do your class in May, then you get the $50 price. So you get 60% off. You have to remember to type in the word sale under the coupon code and it'll drop the price from $125 to $50. But you have to book it and it has to the, the show has to take place in May to be able to get that price. So that's still going on. You can still get that. And this information is posted on our Dinosaur George Jr. page. Go back, scroll through, and you can find it to get all the details. Now, for schedule, the next class that I'm going to do for everybody, the next free class, is going to be a week from today. It is not, and, and to answer your question, Jake, there's no limit on how many people you can invite for my private lessons. You can invite 100, 200, it doesn't matter. You can invite as many people as you want. And the price stays the same. So there's not a class this Friday. There's not a class this Friday. The next class is going to be May 12th. That's a class on some of the early life before the age of dinosaurs. The Permian life. This thing is so cool. There are so many amazingly weird animals you're going to learn about. So remember, no class this Friday. No class this Friday. The next class is a week from today, same time as this. They, uh, this, um, this class is going to be same time, but it'll be May the 12th. We will post this on our Facebook pages to remind you, okay? All right, now for the really big, big news. Originally, we were going to be offering a lot more interactive things online and we were supposed to roll that out in August. But because of the coronavirus, we've had to put that into high speed and make it available now. And I want to publicly thank Michelle, who is our director of events, who was the driving force behind the new Patreon clubs that we offer. So we now offer three different groups that you can join if you like. It's a club. So let me explain them. First, it is through Patreon. Patreon, if you go Google Patreon, P-A-Y-T-R-E-O-N, and then in their search box type in Dinosaur George, you will find these clubs, and here's what they are. The first club is called the Triceratops Club. For $5 per month, you will get one free live show, just like the one you're seeing today, because after next Tuesday... When we do the Permian one, this is the last of the free shows that I can do. I, I, I am so sorry that I just can't continue to do them all for free. We've probably done probably 10, 15 of these so far. So I, I wish I could do them more, but unfortunately, 
my time is limited and I've got so many other projects that it's very difficult. So now, if you would like to continue after next Tuesday to see these classes, it's a $5 a month fee. Now with that, you get one live lesson, you get periodic updates on new discoveries, new information. Every now and then you will be eligible to get special offers, special sales. We'll tell you where I'm going to be speaking if I'm traveling publicly. And then you get to listen to part of my podcast. I have an audio podcast. You get to listen to the first part of the audio podcast, not the whole podcast, but part of it. So that's what you get if you become a Triceratops Club member. So for $5 a month, you get one of these free shows, and then you get the other things. The next club group is called the Raptor Club. It is $10 every month. For that, you get two live lessons every month, just like the one you're seeing today. You get two of those each month. You get all the things that come with the Triceratops group. But you also get a raptor claw. We send you a replica raptor claw as a one-time welcome gift. So if you sign up for the raptor club, you will get a raptor claw replica. You also are going to get periodic educational short videos. So the short videos, you can... Um, you, you'll learn little short things about different animals. They'll be short to the point. They're really cool. And then you get to get access to all of the past podcasts in their entirety. And there's something like 20 or 30 of them, and they'll be posted on there. So if you become a Raptor Club member for $10 a month, you get two live shows, and you get all of these details. And finally, the big one, the Tyrannosaurus Rex Club, the T-Rex Club. This club is the one that gets everything. Now, this is $20 every month. Your credit card gets charged $20 at the first of each month. In this one, you get everything that the other two clubs get, but you also get a replica T-Rex tooth and a replica Raptor claw, so we mail you one of each of those. You also get a behind-the-scenes look. That is, you get to see all the things that are happening in my company. You get to see us assemble bones. You get to see us work on fossils, that kind of stuff. And you get the entire audio podcast, plus you get the opportunity to send in questions and have your questions answered on the podcast. So those are the three groups. Um, you, can, you can sign up immediately for those, but keep in mind that everybody still gets the free class next Tuesday. You do not have to join the group to see the class next Tuesday. But if you've enjoyed these classes and you want to continue to get them, then I hope that you will continue um, I hope you will sign up to be one of the club members because it's going to be a lot of fun and we're going to post some really cool stuff that nobody else gets to see based on your different club level, okay? We will post complete details on the Dinosaur George Facebook pages, on the Dinosaur George Jr. Dinosaur George Facebook pages. All the information will be there. Don't panic if you didn't have time to read and understand all those, okay? All right, let's get into the meat of it and that is today's lesson, which is sauropods. Now, there's two basic styles. There are the long ones and the tall ones. The long necks are the guys whose bodies are a little more horizontal, meaning that their body goes this way. And then there's big ones like Brachiosaurus who are more tall. They are more vertical. Their heads are way taller. So sauropods started off in the early Jurassic, and or I'm sorry, about the mid-Jurassic, no, early Jurassic is correct. They start off in the early Jurassic, and they make it all the way to the end of the Cretaceous period. And they're very, very unique, and they come in so many different styles. And just like some of the other ones I've had, let me tell you something. It has been impossible, impossible for me to pick and choose between all the sauropods, which ones we're going to talk about, because there's so many cool ones. But let's talk about the oddities that are these animals. First of all, it is their teeth. Their teeth are not designed for chewing. Sauropods did not chew. They use their teeth only to rake the leaves off of the trees. The one in the upper right is Diplodocus. Their teeth are shaped like pencils. The one below that one on the right, that is Camarasaurus. Those teeth are like spoons. And the big one on the very bottom left-hand side is the tooth of Brachiosaurus. You can see they're all different, but they all serve one purpose, and that is not to chew. It is to rake the leaves off the trees. Imagine, again, my hand is a tree and my leaves, my fingers are the leaves. 
They would reach their mouth over, semi-close it, pull back, and strip the leaves off, leaving behind the stick so that more leaves can grow back so their food is replenished. They do not chew in their mouth. They chew inside of their stomachs, and they do that through things called gastroliths. They swallow rocks. They swallow rocks, and those rocks sit within the stomach, and as the dinosaur is moving, its stomach is moving and churning. Our stomach turns all the time. That helps digestion. Those rocks are crushing up the leaves inside of its stomach. We find gastroliths within the stomach cavity. We know that these were swallowed by the dinosaur because the rocks are all smooth and have shown that they have been ground together. When the dinosaur dies, you see this image? Those are the ribs of a big long neck dinosaur. You see those rocks inside the stomach area. Now, we also find rocks around some of the other fossils. That's normal, but you can tell very quickly that they're all different shapes. They're not smooth. They're usually rough. So it's not like these washed into its stomach. These were the rocks that were actually in the stomach when the animal died. So sauropods chew their food technically in their stomach, not in their mouth. In fact, their jaws are not even strong enough to chew all day. They don't chew like that. They swallow. And the reason for that is because they're so big and they need to eat so much food, they do not have time to stop and chew. That would take all day. So instead, they're just swallowing, swallowing, swallowing all day long and picking up all as much vegetation as they can, sending it down to that great big stomach where the grinding of those rocks is going to grind it. Next, let's talk about sauropod nests. Now, we find sauropod nests in certain places, especially in South America. They find where year after year after year, these sauropods migrated to this one location to lay their eggs. Just like modern birds do that, right? Modern birds generally lay their eggs in the same locations year after year after year, unless they're disturbed or destroyed. So sauropods did the same thing. These sauropods would go in and lay their eggs. Sauropod eggs are pretty amazing because, of course, of their size. The largest sauropod egg that's ever been found is um, they're about this, almost the size of a basketball. Not completely, not completely, but almost the size of a basketball. Now, somebody once asked, is it possible that sauropods just had live babies like like some snakes do, right? Or mammals do. Could they have live babies? One of the things that's always been a challenge is how big does an egg have to be from a, for a baby sauropod to be born big enough to survive? I mean, look, if your mom is 40 feet tall, you got to be a big baby when you're born or mom can't even see you. What I believe happened is I believe they all laid eggs. I think they all laid eggs. And I do believe that the babies were born small. But notice how they build a nest. What I think they did, I think they used their back foot to scrape out a nest and then lay their eggs. I think the baby sauropods knew by instinct not to leave the nest after they hatch. Because I believe that mom would drop food down into the nest. She could see the nest like a bullseye, like a target. She could see the nest. I think mom just dropped food down in there and that food rained down on the babies and they all ate. I think they grew very quickly. So I think at first the babies knew, do not leave this nest because if you do, you don't get any food. If you get pushed out of the nest by one of your brothers or sisters, sorry, no protection, no food, you'll probably starve because you're not strong enough to crawl back into the nest. We see birds do that today. It looks horrible, but birds will kick their brothers or sisters out so that they get more food. That's just a survival mechanism. So I believe that they did um, all sauropods laid eggs, even though the egg may only be about the size of, an, of, a, of a soccer ball. Now, somebody once said, hey, um, is it? how come the eggs can't be bigger? Here's why. Here's the thickness of a sauropod eggshell, the one on the right, the thick one. The one on the left is an eggshell from a duck-billed dinosaur. The bigger your egg, the thicker your eggshell has to be, right? To be able to be an egg the size of a soccer ball, you have to have a very thick shell. Because if your shell isn't thick, the egg will break under its own weight. But there's a limit. If the egg was bigger than a soccer ball, 
the eggshell would have to be thicker than the picture I just showed you. And at some point, if the egg is too thick, the baby would never have the strength to escape and get out of it. It could never hatch. And oxygen molecules could not go in and out of the egg. See, oxygen comes and goes through the shell of an egg. That's how, that's how baby birds don't suffocate when they're growing in the egg. Oxygen molecules are coming in and out of the egg. But if the shell got any thicker than the one you see on the right, then the babies would never be able to hatch. So no matter how big the dinosaur was, the baby started off in an egg probably about the size of a soccer ball, but then they grew very, very fast. Like I said earlier, I believe mom would use the nest as a bullseye, as a target, to drop the leaves in. When the babies are big enough to get out of the nest on their own, then I think they stayed with mom. I do not believe that they would lay eggs and walk off like a sea turtle and say, good luck, I hope you survive. I don't think that's possible because they weren't laying enough eggs. You have to lay hundreds of eggs to hope that one survives. What they were laying is between five and 20 eggs, I think, and they had to make sure those babies survived. So I think they're staying with the parents. I think for about the first year, baby longnecks spent their entire life between their mom's legs underneath its stomach. I think they lived under there for defense. I think they stayed under there for protection. I think when mom was eating, she intentionally pulled down leaves and just dropped them in front of her. And the next step she took, the baby's moving with her. The babies get a free buffet. There's a line of food as they go. I don't think mom moved fast. I think she moved very slowly knowing her babies were down there. And I think when it was time to get drinks of water, mom would find a puddle and go walk towards it and step over it. Babies could drink. That's what I believe. I think that's what they were doing. So, these animals are amazing. We know from dinosaur footprints that sauropods lived in family groups because we find footprints with big ones and little ones together. So, that's why I believe that they are taking care of their babies and the babies are growing up with them. Think of sauropods as elephants. Elephants don't have a baby and then leave it and say, I hope you grow up and when you get big, come back and join us. They don't do that. They take care of them. Look at ducks. When a duck has babies, she doesn't say, okay, good luck, I'll see you later. No, she takes care of them till they're big enough to go off on their own. So that's how I believe sauropods were living. They were laying eggs. They were building nests. They were feeding their babies until the babies were big enough to defend for themselves. And then they grew up and became full-grown dinosaurs. Now, enough talk about what they were like. Let's take a look at some of these dinosaurs. Now, again... Choosing was almost impossible. It was so hard to choose. So I wanted to start off with the smallest because I think this one's imp important. Magirosaurus was a small sauropod. This is probably as big as it got. Now there is an island. Is it in Sardinia? There is an island where they found this, what is referred to as a dwarf sauropod. They lived on an island so they didn't grow as big as sauropods living on the mainland because there's not enough food to support a giant long neck. So the very first, or some of these sauropods, this isn't the first sauropod. This, well, I'm sorry, this is, yeah, well, this is the smallest. Magirosaurus is the smallest, and I believe this is one of the ones that lived on an island. So when we think of these big long neck dinosaurs, you know, we always think of them as all being gigantic, and most of them were. To give you an idea of how big some of these were, this is the fingernail of an Apatosaurus. This is the fingernail of that dinosaur. Can you imagine that? That's just the fingernail. That's how big these things are. Look at the size of that thing. Isn't that crazy? So... The first one is relatively small. These are relatively, this is the smallest. But then we're going to jump to some giants. Now, the ones I'm going to talk about now, now are the most common. They're the most common. Diplodocus is one that you've all seen. If any of you have long neck dinosaur toys, my guess is you probably have a Diplodocus in there. The whiptail dinosaur. Uh, JW, thank you. It's an island in Romania. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Diplodocus is a giant whiptail dinosaur, way, way bigger. I forgot to put an image of me next to it to show you scale. I apologize for that. This thing is big. This thing is really big. 
Now, Diplodocus is very common. But if you lived in the Jurassic period in North America, this is the dinosaur you would have seen more than any other dinosaur. This is a dinosaur called Camarasaurus or Camarasaurus. Living in the late Jurassic period, this was the dinosaur that would have been the most common. You would have seen these everywhere. For whatever reason, Camarasaurus is kind of a medium-sized dinosaur. It's not as giant as some of the other ones. And because it's medium size, I believe it could eat low and high both. And because it could reach more food source, it was able to have more babies and populate. their population was greater. If you are a specialized eater, meaning you can only eat one kind of food, then you have limitations. Camarasaurus, in my opinion, did not have those limitations because it is a mid-sized sauropod. So it could reach the food up in some tall trees and down in lower. If you are a diplodocus, you're not really made for reaching way up into the tall trees. You're made for eating more mid-level and low-level. But I think, uh, I believe Camarasaurus could reach higher elevations. And this is, of course, Apatosaurus. Now, this is the one I just showed you the fingernail of. Apatosaurus is the one that most older people, people my age, call it Brontosaurus. I covered this in a previous lesson. Go back and look for it. It's the lesson on dinosaur mistakes. I don't want to go over it again now, but this is Apatosaurus, and this is one that was confused by many people to be Brontosaurus and Apatosaurus. Go look for that lesson, and you'll see it. And now for one that most people absolutely know and love, and that's Brachiosaurus. Now, in this particular picture, this Brachiosaurus has little spiky-looking things. Those, we don't know for sure if those were there, at least the, the way this one looks. That's just the artist adding those. That's not some sort of a weapon. It's not a defense. If they were on there, they were going to be made of flesh, like an iguana, maybe used to show off, and maybe they were brightly colored. But we don't know for certain if Brachiosaurus has them. But in this particular picture, I just want you to know that's not some sort of a weapon. The artist just added it. So, okay, those I just chose the most popular just because I wanted to make sure we cover them. Now, let's talk about something most people never think about when it comes to sauropods, and that is armor and weapons. You never think of armor and weapons when you think of sauropods. You mostly think of them just being giant. And because they're so big, you think, well, they don't need any sort. Why do you need a weapon if you're that big? Well, keep in mind... Not all sauropods were the giant, the biggest animal on the planet at that time. There were sauropods that needed weapons. So let's start with one that is amazing, Shunosaurus. Look at its tail. It has a ball or a club on the end of its tail, and it had spikes sticking out of it. Swing that tail around. If that dinosaur hit you with that tail, let me tell you something. That thing would shatter bones. That would kill you. Don't think of sauropods as being these helpless little animals that have no way of being able to defend themselves because that is not true. Think, Hennessy, I just remembered to take my headphones off. I can't believe you forgot to tell me to take them off. I finally took them off. I only took them off because my ears were getting hot. So, Shoniosaurus has this great big tail club that would have been a remarkable weapon, a remarkable way to defend itself. Bet you never thought sauropods would have a weapon like that. It's like a mace. If you don't know what a mace is, look it up. Go online, look it up. It was a medieval weapon called a mace. This thing has a mace tail, which is a club with spikes. How cool is that? Now, what I consider to be the weirdest-looking sauropod. Bahatosaurus. Bahatosaurus has these big, sharp spikes on its neck, but the spikes point forward. When this dinosaur lowers his head even slightly, it's got these horrifying weapons on its head. Now, it's often confused. A lot of people see it, and they confuse this dinosaur with one called Amargosaurus, but Amargosaurus is different. A Margosaurus is not the same dinosaur, or it's not the same kind of dinosaur because a Margosaurus has spikes that are pointing in a different direction. Bahatosaurus's spikes point forward. And do you guys notice in this picture the artist drew in a little pterosaur sitting on the spike? I believe that sauropods had pterosaurs landing all over them. They're like giant aircraft carriers. 
They land on them for protection, but they also get a free meal. They're picking the um, uh, the pests like the ticks and the fleas and things like that. They're eating those off of the sauropod. The sauropods love the pterosaur. The pterosaurs get a free ride. They get to land on an aircraft carrier, and they, they're picking off the, uh, the um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not pest. Um, oh, my gosh, I can't believe I, parasite. They're picking off parasites. Now, in return, they also may have acted as a lookout, an early warning system for the, for the sauropods. When they see danger, they could scream and squawk and fly off, and that alerts the sauropod to danger. So in this particular picture of Bahatosaurus, you see that they have pterosaurs flying in everywhere. Now, look again closely at the direction that those spines are pointing, and now look at a margosaurus. A margosaurus is another sauropod with weapons, only his are pointing backwards. Bahatosaurus points forward, a margosaurus paint point up and backwards. A margosaurus is an amazing dinosaur. Not very big, but those cool weapons. A margosaurus lived with, I think it's Giganotosaurus. I think a margosaurus lived with Giganotosaurus or Maposaurus, one of those. And if it did, and I'm sure it did, those dinosaurs were taller than a margosaurus. When you look at their weapons, those weapons tell you something. They tell you that it's Weapons are pointing up because the attack is coming from above. If your weapons are facing forward, that means you're fighting something that's closer to your own size. Weapons up means a margosaurus is being attacked by something above him. And some pictures of a margosaurus, the artist put a skin, little flaps of skin between those two group, those two rows of sails, or give it a sail instead of just the spikes. There is no evidence that I'm aware of that says they had fleshy skin between them. I believe that's just an artist's opinion of them. And possibly they did. It would have been kind of cool to see them. I don't think it would have hurt them to have that flap of skin there. I don't know. But a Margosaurus is a very cool-looking dinosaur who has weapons. And now for the dinosaur that has body armor. We learned in other lessons, body armor are pieces of bone that are sort of stuck in the skin. Uh, those pieces of bone are weapons, are, are defensive. Saltosaurus is one of the dinosaurs who has those bony chunks all over its back. All right, how many of you are paying attention? Look at Saltosaurus and tell me, is this dinosaur worried about something shorter than itself? or something taller than itself who's going to attack. Who is attacking Saltosaurus? A short dinosaur or a tall dinosaur? Take a look at that. Take a look at that. I just gave you the information a minute ago. Take a look at that and see. I'm waiting for somebody to answer with your typing in. I wait for somebody to get it correctly. Was this dinosaur's attacker taller or shorter? than Saltosaurus. Thank you, Megan. Nicely done. Taller is correct. Nicely done. Because you see, it was taller than the attacker. I mean, I'm sorry. The attacker was taller than this animal because it needed to be able to defend itself from attack from above. Nicely done, everybody. All right. So Saltosaurus has body armor and Pelosaurus takes that to a new level. And Pelosaurus is like, uh... Attack my back, and you'll get a big surprise. Here's a guy walking around with body armor and these great big spikes. How cool is that looking? And Pelosaurus has these great big sharp pointy spikes. That is crazy cool. And then a dinosaur named Augustinia comes out and goes, uh, you think your weapons are cool? Take a look at my weapons. Take a look at Augustinia. Now that is some pretty cool weapons. Those are very cool weapons. Not many dinosaurs are going to mess with a dinosaur like uh, Augustinia. Isn't that cool? Isn't that really, really cool about when you look at that guy, how cool that is? All right, let's look at some oddities, some oddballs, a couple of strangers. This guy is probably one of the strangest. This is Nigersaurus, named for Niger, Africa. Or some people call it Nigerosaurus because if you, if you pronounce Niger as a Niger, 
This would be Nigerosaurus for you, but I call it Nigerosaurus. Look at the mouth of this sauropod. Look at the mouth of this thing. Tell me this is just a gigantic, a gigantic lawnmower. That mouth, let me do this. Let me see if I can change this real quick. Hang on a second here. Let me see if I can expand this to show you here. Look at the shape of this animal's mouth. Look at those tiny little teeth. They look like a comb. They look like a comb because they are raking the leaves off of the trees. So this is Nigerosaurus. What a cool-looking dude. What a cool-looking dude. And now another oddity is Mementosaurus. And I only call him an, uh, an oddity because he's got that incredibly extra-long neck. Think of the muscle power it would take to keep that neck out. Think of the energy it takes to hold something that long up. Its neck is longer than a big yellow school bus. That's how big its neck was. That's how long its neck was. Longer than a school bus. This thing is crazy looking with that long, elongated neck. And then there's another dinosaur that also has a long neck, and that's Barosaurus. And they believe Barosaurus could stand up on its back legs when it needed to reach higher into a tree or maybe for defense. You see, when you're being attacked, the attacker wants to go for your throat or your head. Why? Because if they grab you by the throat, you can't breathe. Your weapons don't matter because you can't breathe. If they grab you by the head, your brain runs everything. Your weapons don't matter if they can get you by the head. A sauropod whose neck goes long like this has got to get that head up out of harm's way when being attacked because that's the first place they're going to attack. You don't have any weapons up here in the front. Your weapons are either on your back or in some cases on your tail or your feet are your weapons. So they want to attack the head. So what they believe is dinosaurs like Barosaurus may have been able to stand up on its hind legs as a way to defend itself. And the reason for that is because its center of gravity, the, like, have you ever been on a teeter-totter, a seesaw? Well, the center of gravity is right in the middle if you got something on each end. But sauropod's center of gravity was back by its back legs because the back end weighed more than the front. So it could stand up very easily because it didn't take a lot of energy because its center of gravity is back by its hips. So they believe Barosaurus and probably other of these long necks would have been able to stand upright. One more time about today that I forgot to mention, your homework. Yes, it always comes with homework. You'll notice that on a lot of these, I am not listing their size and I'm not listing where they're from because that's what I want you to research. I want you to pick one of these that you saw today I want you to research how big it was and where it lived and post your research on the Dinosaur George Jr. Facebook page. We love seeing your reports. I love some of you even go, some of you even draw and do a great amount of work. I'm so proud of all of you. So your homework for today is either pick one of these that you saw and tell me how big it was and where it lived or take a picture of any sauropod you have. If it's a toy, Take a picture of your toy. If it's a picture in a book, take a picture of a picture in the book and post those on our page because we love seeing them, okay? All right. Now let's end it with the Titans. The biggest animals that ever walked the earth were the Titans, the giant sauropods. These are the biggest animals that ever walked the earth. Bigger than any mammal. Maybe blue whales were longer but they didn't walk the earth. So we're going to go. Now, let me say this about size, because this is such a hard question, because I get so many people that ask me, who is the biggest dinosaur? Well, that depends on a couple of things. When you say big, do you mean who is the tallest? Or do you mean who is the longest? Or do you mean who weighed the most? So that's a hard one, right? Because some dinosaurs have the long body. Some dinosaurs have the tall body. So your body could be way longer, but you may not weigh as much as somebody who's tall. So choosing the Titans, I simply have them chosen by those that we know. And here's the other problem with telling you how big they were. We do not know the size of these dinosaurs because in most cases, most of the skeleton isn't there. 
we have to estimate. Well, I say we, I mean people who are actually digging them up and studying them. They have to estimate the size. And there's something else. Think about this. If you have back bones, or if you have bones from the top of, from the back of your neck all the way to your tail, and let's say there's a hundred of them, those bones don't connect like this. There has to be something in between them. Your back bones have cartilage between them. Your bones, if your bones rub together, it is unbelievably painful. That's why people that have back problems, usually because their bones are rubbing together, it's unbearably painful. Well, sauropods had to have cartilage between them. The question is, how much cartilage was there? Was it this thick between each bone? Or was it that thick? Or was it that thick? Well, if you have 100 vertebra, and I say your cartilage is this thick, and then I estimate your length, what if the cartilage was that thick? That means I made you way shorter than you really were because you have to include that in the size, right? So we're only going to talk about the Titan size based on the biggest estimate we think they could have been, okay? Let's start with Soro Poseidon, 112 feet long from the tip of its nose to the base of its tail. It weighed 77 tons, 77 tons. An average elephant weighs three tons. 77 tons, an elephant weighs three tons. If any of you are good at math, I want you to post the answer. How many elephants does Soro Poseidon weigh? If you're using a three-ton elephant, how many times does three go into 77? All right, that's Sora Poseidon. I'm going to watch for your answer. So if somebody figure it out right now and post your answer because I'm going to announce it in a minute. Sora Poseidon weighs 77 tons. If it's a three-ton elephant, how many elephants does Sora Poseidon weigh? All right, that's Sora Poseidon. Now let's go to Supersaurus. Supersaurus was 120 feet long, but weighed only 36 tons. Remember what I said about estimating size, how difficult it is because some dinosaurs are long, some dinosaurs are heavy. So Supersaurus is 120 feet long. Seismosaurus was shorter. Supersaurus weighed 36 tons. Seismosaurus weighed 77. Thank you, Zach. 28.5 elephants. That's a lot of elephants. It weighs as much as that dinosaur weighs as much as 28 elephants or 25 or 22, whatever the answer is. I don't know. I can't check. I don't have a calculator. So Supersaurus is 120 feet long and 36 tons. Then there's Patagotitan, 121 feet long and 77 tons. This thing is so enormous, you probably felt the ground move when this thing was walking by. And now, what is considered the largest dinosaur that ever lived by most paleontologists is Argentinosaurus. Most people believe that Argentinosaurus represents as big as dinosaurs can get. Remember when I talked about why they can't lay eggs that are much bigger than a soccer ball, and why we will probably never find a dinosaur egg bigger than that is because at some point, things become too big and they cannot survive. You cannot get enough food. You cannot get enough water. You cannot be strong enough to do things like just walking around. So most scientists believe that Argentinosaurus would have been the biggest a dinosaur could ever get. They think that they that that dinosaurs simply could not get bigger than Argentinosaurus. It would just be very difficult. Now, let me tell you this. I know recently there was the discover what was its name? Dreadnoughtus. I think it's called Dreadnoughtus. When Dreadnoughtus was announced, the scientists who found it gave an estimate of size. And his estimate was it could be between this and this size, right? Well, the media only wants to hear the biggest size. And that's why sometimes there's a new discovery and the headlines say, dinosaur found bigger than Argentinosaurus. Biggest dinosaur in the world discovered. No dinosaur was as big. And yet, later on, people come along and say, that dinosaur isn't as big as Argentinosaurus. 
And the scientists, usually it's not the scientists' fault. Usually the scientists are going, hey, I didn't say it was bigger. I said here is the range of size, and the newspaper reporters and the TV reporters only heard me say the big size. And they wanted it to be amazing, so they wanted it. They, they exaggerate the truth just to draw attention to the press. That's what they do. It's a shameful thing, but they do it. Let me get off my soapbox. <laughs> so in the case of Dreadnoughtus, when it was first announced, everybody said this is the biggest dinosaur that ever lived. Later on, after looking at more attention, they came to the realization that it was not as big as Argentinosaurus. So for right now, as best as we can tell, <laughs> Jake, that's funny. As best as we can tell, Argentinosaurus is the largest dinosaur that ever lived. Now, how cool would it be if they find something bigger? That would be cool. All right, let me, ref let me talk one more time just to make sure everybody is clear. A week from today, I am doing the last free lesson that's free to everybody, and this one will be on Permian Dinosaurs. So for those of you that have been with me through all of the lessons, if you choose not to join one of the clubs, I understand completely. We've all been in quarantine. Most of us aren't working. I totally understand. But please understand, I wish I could do them for free, but I just can't because I'm in the same situation everybody else is. We're not working as much, and so what I do, I just I have, I have payroll. I have employees that have to get paid. So unfortunately, after next Tuesday, I, I just can't do – these for free because there's a lot of work that goes into them all the work that goes into them i hope you understand but if you decide that you want to join one of our clubs here again is the brief outline if you join the triceratops club you will get one show every month just like the lesson you learned today for free you'll get updates on things and you'll be allowed to hear the first part of my audio podcast and you'll be able to hear the podcast through our page if you become a Raptor Club member, then every month you have to pay $10 every month. So if you guys are using birthday money or Christmas money, remember, you have to uh, you have to pay for this out of your own pocket uh, unless you can negotiate with your parents. In this club, you get two shows like this every month, so it's one every other week. You get a free Raptor Claw, uh, a replica Raptor Claw, and you get little short videos, and you get access to the first part of the new podcast, but you get to listen to all the old podcasts. And if you are a Triceratops Club member, you may listen to some of the podcasts. I think we've loaded some of them. You get to listen to some of them so you can see if you like them or not. And then finally, the T-Rex Club members, this is $20 every month. You have to come up with $20. You have to work around the house. You have to earn your money, whatever you're going to do. But it's $20 every month. And then this one, you get two live shows Plus, you get a bunch of behind-the-scenes videos. You get direct emails. You get pictures that nobody else gets to see. And you also get to listen to the entire podcast. And you get to submit questions that get answered during that time. And if you join the Triceratops Club and you want to upgrade later, you can upgrade. You don't have to join the – you don't have to become a T-Rex member right away. You can join one and see if you like it, okay? All right, everybody. I hope that you all enjoyed this lesson. Again, thank you, Michelle, for driving the Patreon bus forward. It was all of her work. She worked so hard behind the scenes to get this done in advance. Uh, thank you, Lexi, for, by the way, Lexi is our official social media director. Thank you for all the work that you do as well. Now, for all of you out there, I will spend a little bit of time answering some of your questions. Thank you all. And, and again, next week's class is free. You don't have to join one of the clubs to hear next week's class. It's free, but it's on Tuesday, not Friday. No class this Friday. Next Tuesday, 10 o'clock, same time. Okay, everybody? With that, class is dismissed. Have a great day, everybody. And now I will do questions.